Welcome everybody to Westminster Canterbury, Shenandoah Valley here in Winchester, Virginia. I'm Bob Sherwood, a longtime resident. We are CCRC and uh, we have for some time uh, trained staff uh, on uh, how to approach those with dementia. Um, our panel today is going to look particularly at the question of what can be learned, what can be taught uh, in the way of skills at the threshold moment, a difficult time uh, before there's a di final diagnosis that may be valuable later on. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I think this is great that you're participating in our webinar, uh, partnering with Park Springs down in Atlanta. Absolutely, and, excited to uh, do it. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, so, you're going to be the first person on our panel this afternoon and okay. uh, suggest let's talk a little bit about the context of what we're doing. Here. Okay. Uh, dementia is something that's been with human beings for an awfully long time, uh, but the approach has not been always uh, the same as, exactly. as now. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, but we've had some advances in the last, uh, well, certainly in mm -hmm. the last hundred years uh, from being locked up and, uh, uh, yeah. well, treated badly, uh, but often families just took care of the, of the person in the home mm -hmm. and did the best they could. But there were a lot of misunderstandings of what dementia is. Now we've learned that it's, it's a deterioration of the brain, and I think uh, Tipa Snow mm -hmm. uh, and yes. Dr. Al Powers, uh, among those, probably the real pioneers, cutting through and saying, okay, there's still capability. These people have Absolutely. had great lives and they're still uh, fully capable of many things, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, take it from there. Where are we now in that regard? Oh, wow. So I guess what I've learned over the years is that we have more to learn. So we, we've yeah. learned a lot, and um, I think what we, we just need to continue to educate ourselves and others um, because that is how we're going to better, that's how we're going to provide the best care for our residents uh, living with dementia. And the, the most important thing um, that we have learned is that persons living with dementia are doing the absolute best that they can. Um, if anyone needs to change, it's us. So we need to change the way we interact with people uh, living with dementia, the way we approach uh, people living with dementia. Um, and because the goal is really to provide the best quality of life for them, that, that is the absolute goal. So at Westminster Canterbury, we have been expanding and enhancing our memory uh, care program as part of our strategic plan uh, for many years. Um, why? Because it's the right thing to do and, and our residents deserve nothing less. So that's being creative, it, it's having fun, it's learning new things, it's pushing forward. And if, if you go into it with that attitude of constantly learning, you're gonna be, everybody's gonna benefit from that. People have a sense that uh, dementia is, is so strange that only real experts can. Yeah, uh, no. You know, we, we are not dementia care experts. What we are is a group of people committed uh, to making life better for persons living with dementia. You do not have to be a highly credentialed scholar or a PhD uh, to, to learn and to, to practice uh, dementia care. Uh, what the participants are going to um, hear from today is, is our staff. Um, who, who are making a difference, our staff and residents, who are making a difference each and every day. Um, you know, whether it's fitness, whether it's someone in our maintenance department, um, you know, everybody um, has a role to play. And again, it, 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 we're not, I'm not a PhD, I'm just someone who loves doing what I do, and that's, that's what it takes. Well, Jeannie, thank you very much. We'll go to the panel, okay. um, and we'll watch the interviews, and come back to you for a closing Sounds few great, words. thank you. Okay. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mr. How Sherman. are you doing this afternoon? Good, good thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, we're here in, a, in a, uh, the shop. Yes, sir. You're one of the guys who's on the teaching team for the uh, positive approach to care. Yeah, that's correct. I'm for, a coach. For our dementia of, of folks. Yep. Yeah. Yep. How's that going? Great. Great. Yeah. Just got recertified today. Okay. Yep. Um, the question that we're working on is, um, we've talked about it before, but... Uh, mm -hmm. What is it that you would want to suggest to other communities, right. uh, whether they have a lot of resources and, and a lot of uh, skilled and right. uh, 
credentialed people or not, mm -hmm. right. that uh, the community would want to undertake mm -hmm. in improving their support for those with the dementia? Well, I think what uh, I'd like to suggest, or what I like to try to do, is when I get with another uh, resident living with dementia, is get to know that person. Try to learn the core, the type of uh, activities they liked when they were uh, younger, in the movies, maybe the sports, uh, activities so I could try to make an inroads to what they liked to get something common with them. And then that would open them up and see if they like humor and uh, investigate that and then really try to get a good rapport with them, try to uh, understand their life give them some pleasures in life that they've had over the years as far as like what brought them pleasure. Because um, it's been a, a time now of, you know, loneliness with everybody having to be separated and try to bring back the good memories yeah. and uh, successful. Yeah, you, you're kind of surprised that uh, they're able to do more than you might have guessed. Oh, absolutely. They've lost some, but they still got a lot. <laughs> Donna, I know you've had some experience because you've been supporting a young woman with uh, autism for, what, about 14 years? 14 years. years. Yeah. And you've also been supporting our people in the memory support area, Blue Ridge. Yes. Uh, helping them with exercise. Absolutely. So uh, the question is, what would you want to suggest to really any community that wants to improve their dementia support, whether they have uh, advanced degree staff, uh, credential staff or not? What are the things that are most important to do uh, to improve support for those residents living with dementia? Well, one of the most important things that I have learned over the years is time. Time means everything. You have to make sure that the person may not recognize you every time but they will know that they know you from somewhere and so um, spending time with them you you'll get the true meaning of, of their emotion if they're happy if they're sad if they're lonely if they need more interaction if they need to laugh if they like to sing um, being the exercise person, I, that's the first thing that I do. I try to find out if they like to walk, if they like to listen to music while they exercise. Um, just things that will really make them happy, make them feel secure. And so too much talking, especially for me, is something that I have to, to really pay attention to. And so if they do better with some kind of signal, some kind of si si sign, um, perhaps come here. That if they know you and then you say come here, they'll recognize that and then it'll come to them who you are and you're a safe person and you're somebody that they can open up with. And, um, and, and just spending time with people, getting to know them, letting them tell their story, or maybe not talking at all, just if they look at you and you know, you can you can basically tell, you know, just by common sense sometimes of, you know, how they're feeling that day. If they look lethargic or if, you know, if they if they ask you for food, you know, they're hungry, you know, just simple things. And it may be that they may not be hungry, but they're just thinking of a favorite food. So maybe just a conversation. Richard, thank you for showing that. Uh, uh, my let's, pleasure. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, possible connection between Tai Chi uh, and dementia, its application in dementia, particularly dementia at the early beginnings, the threshold period. Okay, it's my opinion that, um, that in dementia, you're concerned a great deal about stress and trying to alleviate stress in the individual. So if you notice in the very beginning when I very slowly breathe in and very slowly breathe out with Tai Chi. That right away I'm telling my mind that I'm not in a fight or flight situation. I stop pumping adrenaline. 
and right away I start pumping endorphins. So Tai Chi embraces good health procedures all throughout the form. There's a concentration on synchronizing your breathing with all of the movements. There's a concentration on keeping your posture correct and also in keeping your mind at ease all the way through. And I think that these things are important for anybody facing dementia. Um, talk a little bit of, about the, um, the possibility of training someone in this, perhaps as a brand new exercise for them, something they've never done before, and then the possibility that they can continue to track and grow in the meditation motion uh, as they go deeper into dementia. Right. It's interesting when people look at Tai Chi being done, they say to themselves, oh, that's really easy. But in fact, Tai Chi is very complex. However, Tai Chi can be broken down into stages and you can build upon each stage. So starting with the simplest things, you learn how to walk, you learn how to breathe properly, you learn how to keep your posture straight up and down. And then as time goes on, you can get more involved in the in-depth level of learning how to synchronize your hand movements with your foot movements, your body movements, a lot more complexity to it. But regardless of age or regardless of your capabilities, anybody can learn Tai Chi, even if they only learn the first basic moves. They they can benefit from that. Do you know of any place where Tai Chi has been used to support those with a dementia? Well, there are a couple places that come to mind. At NIH, they had a program for uh, soldiers suffering under PTSD, which is, in my mind, more of a stress issue, but nevertheless, they found that, that Tai Chi was a good way to address calming the people getting them focused on something other than their daily problems. And as I mentioned, Tai Chi can be complex. So the more that you think about Tai Chi, the less you think about these other issues and problems. Well, Richard, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Very helpful, very suggestive. Richard's comments lead to the suggestion that one of our Wait to Serve staff people, Heather Underwood, made, and that is that Sign language, teaching signing, could be a very important coping skill. It's been useful, of course, with infants and children uh, and in other contexts, so that might be another suggestion you could look at. Gail, good to see you here in your art studio. Um, you've had an interesting career. Art's been key to that, and you've come to Westminster Canterbury because your mom came to be a resident, and then she went into a dementia. Um, Help us to understand how art can support those with a dementia, particularly at the beginning of the, at the threshold of a dementia. And tell us a little bit about your mom. Okay, I'm glad to be here and be a part of this. I was, my mother developed dementia and she painted and she also did play piano. And the one thing that, I noticed was she stopped doing those things early on because she knew how well she could do them and she couldn't do them as well. And so she stopped for a while, but then that creativity was still there and she started again. So, but that period of time where she knew she couldn't play the piano the way that she used to, she stopped playing. So that was very scary time for her. So if you see that, know that that's part of the could be part of the process. So now she she does paint, and I bought her a little keyboard, and she plays that. And I her motor skills you can watch her hands, and her her hands still move in the same way, although she can't play a tune like she used to. And have so, you seen that in other? Other residents too? I have, I have. So it's a common pattern then? Yes. So the, you stop because you know you can't do it like you, you want to 
How, how have you found yourself helping others to recover their creativity in art? So I, I come up with different ideas of projects that we can do. And uh, a person who is first going into dementia, I try to maybe give them watercolor paper with the drawing already on it and watch them play with that and watch them be successful. And that's one of the first things to do is make sure that the person is successful. And so I try, I start with, I always start with butterflies. <laughs> that's just the way I am. So, and butterflies are beautiful and they can be any color, so it doesn't matter. Um, but I also, you know, as art teachers, we're always dealing with a budget. And so there's a lot of things that I just keep my eyes open for. And I buy things used. There's a lot of things that are donated because people have garages and basements full of art materials that they don't use anymore. So I'm gonna tell you, show you a couple of projects. This is one that you can do very simply. You can use construction paper. This was a, a used frame that I found I probably paid a dollar for it. And a lot of the people in our dementia unit used to do quilting or some sort of fiber art. And so I thought, let's do something like that. They can't, maybe can't, don't have the dexterity to sew real tight or uh, the eyesight. Their eyes aren't that good. So what we did was we painted paper but you could use anything. You can use construction paper. And then I, I knew the size of the frame, so I cut the squares up so that they would fit. And we made a paper quilt. This is a project when you're thinking about people who are engineers or people who enjoy ge geometry. Uh, so I got old picture frames and somebody donated a bunch of glass squares and we, we did these, they would lay it out, and then I would take it back to the studio and put the glue on because the glue is toxic. The other thing that really got people talking to each other was a project we did with plants, and I wanted to stimulate their senses, so I used plants that were smelly, like uh, rosemary and um, lavender, and, and different plants from my garden and even tomatoes. I mean, there's a certain smell to tomatoes. Oh, yeah. And uh, we used clay and they know how to roll a rolling pin and they rolled out the clay and they pressed the plants in. And the interesting thing was we started talking about gardening and most people have gardened. And the, the conversation was just, it was like, they just went outdoors and it was just so flowing. Talking about their gardens and smelling and the textures and it's all very stimulating. Plants are very, very healing. So these are some of the projects that I've been, been doing with uh, our residents. We interviewed one other staff member, Mike Rice. However, uh, Bill Young, our intrepid cameraman and uh, guru and fellow resident uh, were not able to video Mike uh, because here at Westminster we have uh, a number of internal preventative measures to protect against the Corona-19 uh, infection. Uh, Mike's a, a med tech with long experience and he now works in our Blue Ridge memory support area. Uh, his suggestions run along these lines. Use whatever it takes to find out, particularly at the threshold, what the core of the person's life has been, what their central passion was, and then find ways, clues, triggers to help the person get back to that anchor. A clue or trigger may be an object, a sound, a gesture, a phrase, whatever. Eye contact is very important. Don't overwhelm the person with multiple thoughts. Keep it simple. Then work to support the person's capabilities that are still there, things like humor, 
relationship, creativity, intense emotions, particularly awareness of the deep mystery of life itself. You join their journey. Don't invite them to join yours. And as they say in the Navy, it's not a job, it's an adventure. It's challenging, but it can be done. He suggests anyone can do it. We hope our panel has given you some suggestions that you can use fairly immediately. Uh, one last step suggestion I'd like to offer is that people with dementia can experience, among many other things, many capabilities, is embarrassment. And it's important to sense where that embarrassment sets in and how you can get beyond that. That's where the richness comes. Uh, and it requires sensitivity and work, but anyone can do it. All right, I just wanted to kind of close our session out by thanking everyone uh, for spending time with us and, and hearing a little bit more about our story. Um, I hope that some of the things you learned or heard will resonate with you and your communities. And you know, it goes back to the old saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And really that is just the goal with dementia care. Have fun, be creative. Um, you know, you will, you will be rewarded uh, for your efforts. So stay safe and stay well.